Pastor Ed here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey with daily devotions for Friday, uh, June the 24th, 2022. Once again, we continue our look, our conversation, whatever, um, at uh, uh, that phrase, that off used but often misused phrase, I think, uh, the will of God. You know, what do we mean by that? Uh, Dr. Leslie Weatherhead, the English pastor who wrote uh, the slim little um, uh, book entitled The Will of God, um, based on um, his response to the things that were going on in his London congregation during and after, immediately after the Second World War, with all the, the tragedy and the sadness and the, the destruction and everything else. You know, what do we, is, is this God's will? What is, what do we mean when we say God's will? And he broke that down into God's uh, intentional will, which we looked at last week, and that had to do with what God wanted for us. In particular, what God created in the beginning and saw that the creation was very good. God's intention from the very beginning uh, was, was good, good for us, good for the world. Um, but human beings have free will. Human beings have sinned and disobeyed and rebelled and brought much suffering and tragedy upon ourselves. Um, and so what does, what is God to do? Well, as Weather had looked at scripture and thought about it, it seems as though he thought, and I think he has a great point here, that, that God responds to that. And God has what we, what he termed a circumstantial will. In other words, there's God's intention, God's intentional will what god wanted for us but when when we mess things up when we screwed up god had to intervene and again the classic story that i began the week with of, with uh, the story of joseph and his brothers you meant evil against me but god turned it into good god turned uh, is constantly throughout scripture turning bad situations if not totally around at least bringing some good out of them and we saw that in the story of the Babylonian exile. We saw that um, in the story of Jesus' prayer in, in the garden where um, Jesus prayed not for his own will to be done, but God's will be done. Uh, and today we're going to look at, at Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, the fifth chapter, uh, where he talks about the significance of what God has done for us uh, in Jesus Christ. But before we get into that, uh, let's begin, as we always do, with the service of responsive prayer. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For, thy, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Show us your mercy, O God, and grant us your salvation. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Give peace in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Keep the nations under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and sustain me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. Father, because you are gracious and merciful, your will is always oriented toward our benefit. And yet this world we live in is cast in darkness. It can be difficult to understand your will for us. What seems to us to be good is sometimes not. Illuminate the darkness around us that we might understand your will. 
Speak to us through your holy word so that we might continue in our understanding. Amen. Well, as I said, today we're going to look at a passage. Actually, I think uh, today and tomorrow, we'll finish up the week with this one too. Um, Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, which reads like this, verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we've been justified by his blood, will we, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. At the right time, while we were still weak, Christ died for us. That doesn't sound like God's intention. That doesn't sound like God's plan. That doesn't sound like God's will. Oh, yeah, you guys are going to really mess up, and so then I could send Jesus to swoop in and, and, and make things right. No, it doesn't sound like It sounds like we mess things up, and God then had to respond out of love, out of grace, out of mercy, responded in Christ to, to transform the situation, to give us hope, um, to, to give us a way out of the mess that we've created uh, for ourselves. Um, I come back to this a lot, but the, this, the, there's just so many powerful stories that come out of the Second World War, and, and in particular the Holocaust. And of all the places, um, Auschwitz, um, it's estimated that six million Jews were killed altogether, and a good portion of them uh, were killed at Auschwitz. Um, and it still stands as a stark um, reminder of, of, of human evil, of human sinfulness. It's been said that a half a ton of human hair is still preserved. The showers that sprayed poison gas are still there. But for all the ugly memories of Auschwitz, um, there are some stories of, of beauty, of grace, of love. Um, it's the memory that uh, a, a man by the name of uh, Gajanicek, I always have trouble pronouncing it, has of Maximilian Kolbe. Um, you see, in February of 1941, Kolbe was incarcerated uh, at Auschwitz, along with thousands of others, of course. Um, he was a little different, though, in that he was a Franciscan priest. And in the harshness um, of this inhuman camp, he somehow maintained the gentleness of Christ. He shared his food. He gave up his bunk. He prayed for his captors, even. Uh, and he was soon given the nickname, the Saint of Auschwitz. Well, in Ju July of that same year, again, 1941, uh, there was an escape from the prison. And apparently it was the custom at Auschwitz to kill 10 prisoners for every one who escaped. All the prisoners would be gathered in the courtyard, and the commandant would randomly select 10 names uh, from the roll book. And those victims would be immediately taken to a cell where they would receive no food or water until they died. Well, the commandant began calling out the names as each, at each selection another prisoner stepped forward to fill this, this sinister, this evil quota. Well, the tenth name he called out is uh, Gajanicek. And as the SS officers checked the numbers of the condemned, one of the condemned begins to sob. My wife and my children, he cries. And the officers turn as they hear movement among the prisoners. And the guards raise their rifles. The dogs tense, anticipating a command to attack. 
The prisoner has left his row and is pushing his way to the front. It's Colby, Father Colby. No fear on his face, no hesitancy in his step. Uh, the capo shouts at him to stop or be shot. I want to talk to the commandant, he says, calmly. And for some reason, the officer doesn't kill or club him. Colby stops a few feet, paces from the commandant, removes his hat, and looks the German officer in the eye. Herr Commandant, I wish to make a request, please. That no one shot him is a miracle. I want to die in the place of this prisoner. He points to the sobbing uh, Gijanacek. The audacious, audacious request is presented without stammer. I have no wife or children. Besides, I'm old and not good for anything. He's in much better condition. Uh, Colby knew well the, the Nazi mentality that a younger, stronger person um, uh, could, be, could be used as slave labor as opposed to an old, weak um, man. Who are you? The officer asks. A Catholic priest. Well, the block is stunned. The commandant uncharacteristically is speechless and after a moment he barks request granted well prisoners were never allowed to speak um, Gajanacek says I could only thank him with my eyes I was stunned he says could hardly grasp what was going on the immensity of it the condemned um, I the condemned am going to live and someone else willingly and voluntarily offers his life for me, a stranger. Is this some dream, he thought to himself. Well, the saint of Auschwitz outlived the other nine. Uh, in fact, he didn't die of thirst or starvation. Um, he died only after the camp doctor uh, injected uh, a poison into his heart. It was August 14th, 1941. Well, Gajanacek survived the Holocaust. He made his way back to his hometown. But every year, however, he goes back to Auschwitz. Every August 14th, he goes back to say thank you to the man who died in his place. And in his backyard, there's a plaque, a plaque that he carved with his own hands, a tribute to Maximilian Kolbe, the man who died so that he could live. Father Colby didn't create that situation, didn't create the rules, didn't create the, 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 the evil, horrific rule that if someone escapes, 10 people, 10 others are going to die. Um, but he stepped forward. He intervened. He responded to those circumstances. And he saved the life. And the man was eternally grateful uh, for his life being saved. That's what God in Christ has done. God didn't cause this mess that we call the human condition. We brought that on ourselves. But God in Christ intervened on our behalf. That's God's circumstantial will, that his response, God's response to the circumstances that we've created but can't work our way out of. Only God could respond in such a way to bring something good or to transform the evil uh, into good. Um, we are helpless without God's intervention. The September 11th, 2002 issue of Time magazine had a touching article about 31-year-old Janelle Guzman. Uh, Janelle was the last of just four people who were caught uh, in the debris of the Twin Towers a year earlier, um, to be found alive. After the planes hit the World Trade Center, uh, you see Janelle was descending a staircase from the 64th floor of the North Tower. Steel beams weakened to their breaking point, solid concrete was pulverized, but somehow her body found an air pocket. Her right leg was pinned under heavy concrete pillars. Her head was caught between stacks of wreckage, but somehow she was still alive. And for 27 hours, Guzman lay trapped and seriously injured. Uh, in recent months before the attacks, Janelle had started atten attending a church called the Brooklyn Tabernacle. 
wanted to get her life turned around. So while she was there stuck in the rubble, she began to pray. And she'd trail off into sleep and then wake up and pray some more. Well, shortly after noon on Wednesday the 12th, she heard voices. And so she screamed as loud as she could, I'm here, hey, I'm right here. And a rescue worker responded, do you see the light? She didn't. She took a piece of concrete and banged it against the broken stair, the broken stairway overhead, probably the same structure that had saved her life. And the searchers um, found, followed and found the noise and found her. Uh, Janelle wedged her hand through a crack in the wall and felt someone grab it. And she heard a voice say, I've got you. And Janelle Guzman said, oh God, thank you. It took 20 long minutes and then she was saved. In many ways, um, Janelle Guzman represents the plight of all people. We are buried under an enormous mess of spiritual black marks, ways that we have wronged God and each other. The Bible calls this sin. We have no hope of freeing ourselves. We are truly stuck in need of rescue. But by admitting the need to be forgiven, by the need to be rescued, by reaching out and saying, God, help me, I can't get out of this unless you save me, we can be confident that he hears and helps. That's what we remember, that God reached down into the rubble and saved us by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God didn't plan for this. God didn't intend for this tragedy that has befallen us. But while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for us. Well, I hope you have a great day. Looking forward to having one more chance to talk about this with you tomorrow. Uh, until then, take care.